The historic 1998 Holy Day of Atonement Address, Atonement, the Healing for a Sin-Sick Nation, is now available. Hear the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan speak on such topics as America, a modern Nineveh, how President Clinton can save the country, Atonement, the Healing Ball, the eight steps of atonement, what are they? You can add this historic address to your collection on CD or videotape for the unbelievable price of only $19 per item. To purchase this and many other lectures by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, call the Final Call Administration Building at 773-602-1230 or write to 734 West 79th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60620. that he is now in, he's not fit for self. Uh-huh. If I had a hundred sheep and one of them got away, I would leave the 99 go back. You have to be completely uh, made over again. Family March is now available on video cassette, featuring the timely and inspiring message by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The family is the basic unit of civilization. Therefore, everything must be done to care for the family unit. The Million Family March on video cassette, only $29.95. Call 1-888-695-3982. the merciful, 
we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the human family. We thank him for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel of the New Testament. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. As a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I could never thank Allah enough for his coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and his intervention in our affairs, raising up among us one to lead, teach, and guide us to the straight path of God, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very thankful to Allah to be with you again. I want to thank our visitors and friends who have uh, visited us from various communities in Chicago. And I want to thank my many helpers from around this nation who have honored me by their presence on this weekend. I hope, as I always do, that what Allah blessed me to give to you will be beneficial to you, helpful to you, and raise you in degree of excellence. What is the purpose of communication? Almighty God allowed oral language long before the written. And he gives animals and birds and all of his creatures a sound that they make which the other creature of similar nature can understand that sound. I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say that David was taught the language of the birds. That means that birds have a means of expression and communication that other birds understand. We as human beings, the greatest of God's creation, however, have trouble communicating. What is it about the language that we use that creates confusion rather than understanding. This is not my subject, but I just thought I would uh, enter it by this door. The, uh, the human being is like the Tower of Babel. We all speak different languages, 
And even when we speak the same language, we have problems communicating our thoughts, our ideas to one another. In each of us, there is a predisposition to misunderstand. And in each of us, there is an inclination to understand. But the predisposition to misunderstand takes precedence over our inclination to understand. And what is this predisposition to misunderstand? We may not like the way the person looks. We may not be in a mood to hear. We may not like the person who's talking to us. And we may just be hungry. And when you're hungry, you don't necessarily want to hear somebody talk. Now, all these little things become impediments to hearing. So the scripture says, him that hath ear, let him hear, let him hear. That grammatically is you is the subject understood, you, let him, in the third person, hear, you, 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 <laughs> you, you, and you, let, permit, him, who is him? Him is you. Him that hath ears, let him hear. So you, who would hinder him from hearing, get out of the way. And that which would be an impediment to his or her hearing, get out of the way. Permit yourself to hear. Because it is only by hearing that the word of God can enter the ear and the heart and on sound will travel light. And we know that light travels at 186,000 miles per second and sound travels 1,120 feet per second. But here is the speed of light traveling in sound. So the slower sound is carrying the speedy light because the word of God has three elements to it. It is light, it is life, it is power. But it comes to you on air at the speed of sound. So if you would be enlightened, enlivened, and empowered, first get the impediment to hearing out of the way. Now, if you don't like Muslims, that's an impediment. 
you don't like black people who happen to be light-skinned, that's an impediment. If you have some problem with the suit I'm wearing or with some aspect of my coming to you, these are impediments. Him that hath ears, and you do, let him hear. Get those things out of the way that will stop you from hearing the sound on which is carrying light, which will condemn falsehood at the speed of light. Now, we have all had some religious experience. Either we went to church or we went to the synagogue or we went to the mosque or we heard some preacher talking to us about God's judgment. And sometimes the way Reverend would say it, it would be so frightening, which it is a frightening thing. And he would get us to act better by terrifying us. It's something about fear. and makes people do in order to escape what they're afraid of. So when you pick up the Bible and the Quran and you read about the judgment, the way it is written, it is so terrifying that today many pastors don't want to talk about it. We want to talk about the grace of God, and that's good. The mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. But very few want to talk about the wrath of God. Now, each of you, as human beings, created in the image of God, can, on occasion, get angry. And when you are angry, you are capable of doing that which under normal emotional uh, circumstances you would not do. So anger has degrees to it. I can be angry and have my anger under control. You may see a fire in my eyes. You may hear something in my words, but I'm keeping myself under control. But I'm angry. But there's another kind of anger when we allow it to get to that point where we are unable to control the reaction that comes from our anger. We reach a point then of insanity. We have lost the balance. Then what comes from our mouth, what comes from our hands, can be very destructive. So a wise man, as the Bible teaches, will be slow to anger. If you visit the prison, 
as we sometimes do, we see many, many inmates, male and female, who are there not because they're bad. But a circumstance came up in their lives that ignited the passion of anger. And they lost control. And in that moment of loss of control, they reached for something to inflict pain on the object of their anger. And when it was over and the anger subsided, Someone lay wounded, someone lay dying, and a human being was sent to prison for many, many years because we lacked control of the emotion called anger. In the genesis of the Bible, when God gave Adam instructions and Adam disobeyed, God was displeased with Adam and he was angry with him. But his anger was controlled. He was going to punish Adam, not kill Adam. Sometimes when we, in our homes, make a judgment against our children, and we wish to inflict pain on them to teach them a lesson, sometimes we are so stressed out and so out of control that we literally do terrific harm to both the body and the mind of our children because we couldn't control our anger. Now, Adam knew Eve, and they had two children, Cain and Abel. And the Bible talks about Abel and Cain making an offering to God. And God accepted the offering of Cain and rejected the offering of Abel. Some words of the Bible say that he respected the offering of Abel, but the offering of Cain, for it he had not respect. And most of us, when we think we've been dissed, disrespected, it kindles anger. But the thing that has been wounded is your self-concept which is your ego. And because you may not have the characteristic of humility, you see disrespect as a great insult. And then if the disrespect is fueled by another passion called envy,
then it leads us to anger. So the Bible says, uh, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now, if you look at when they make a happy face on television, they usually make it with the mouth going up. And when they make a sad face, they make it with the mouth going down. Whenever you are angry, there's a change in your countenance. So God saw this in Cain, and the Lord said unto Cain, why are you angry? A good question. God knew why he was angry, but he wanted Cain to examine the motive for his anger. Is it my bruised ego that makes me angry? Did somebody really wrong me? I mean, why am I angry? And why is my countenance fallen? Then God said to Cain, if you do well, should not you be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. When you're angry, right at the door of your anger is sin. Now you, your passion is about to cause you to break the law. So God talked to Cain. Wait, wait a minute. Don't, don't, don't go there. Just stop a minute. Because you're angry, analyze why you're angry. Why are you angry, Cain? Why is your face fallen? Well, I feel this. Well, if you do well, certainly you will be accepted. What? Why do you feel, I feel rejected? And brother, there's nothing that hits the ego as hard as being rejected in comparison to something in somebody that appears to be accepted. And in every family, you have children growing up some feeling accepted, some feeling rejected. The one that feels acceptance, you know, and the one that feels rejected. And the more rejected you are or you feel, the more ugly your face becomes. There was a man sitting at my table the other night, and he was so ugly. I started to ask him, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? Did, did I do something? But I had about 60 people there, so I didn't want to call him out, but the next time, I won't waste any time. 
I will be like God. I'll stop doing whatever I'm doing. And I'll say, Brother, why is your faith falling? Why are you angry? I can tell you, sin lieth at the door. So if you are wise, we have to learn to control the passions that lead us to say and do destructive things. Comparison in and of themselves is not good. I am better. I ran faster. I sang better. I played better. I got more points than you. I put the eight ball in. Ha, ha, ha. Give me the money. Whenever you think you have won and had an advantage over someone else, how you use advantage? Perceived or real can cause anger to come up in the person that you have overcome. I don't care if it's a game of chess or checkers or hand wrestling, a beauty contest. Somebody wins. Somebody does not win. But not winning to some means I lost. Not winning is not losing. Losing is only when you don't understand why you didn't win. Now, maybe I didn't win because that man is faster than I. But I ran the best that I could. And I came in second. I didn't win. Neither did I lose. But if I feel like a loser, then instead of patting the brother that won on his back and congratulating him, I'll be like the woman, Tanya Harding, who hired somebody to take a crowbar and break the leg of somebody who was a better ice skater. That's envy. Anger. Faith falling because you didn't get the good score. Sin lieth at the door. Let me go through the door. Nobody loses who does the best they can. Nobody loses. I got to stop. The great Reverend Al Sampson is here with us. <laughs> Happy anniversary, Reverend Al. Reverend Al is ce celebrating his 45th year in the ministry. <laughs> and next to him is his great mentor and pastor, I'm honored, dear brother, by your presence. We talking here 
on Cain and Abel and anger. God has created human beings in an excellent way. There is no human being who is not possessed of excellence. Not one. You cannot be created in the image or likeness of the most excellent God and not have some of his excellence in you. So whenever you meet a fellow human being, you are meeting some of God's excellence. But excellence has degrees. Some are more excellent in what they do than others. God has created it that way. If you look out at the constellations, they are beautiful. Some stars shine brighter than others, but the beauty of the bright star is not seen except in the light of a star that doesn't shine as brightly in a beautiful constellation. So it is with peace. I loved Allen Iverson, you know. I, I, was, I was knocked out by the beauty of this young, courageous warrior. And the great Mutombo. These are stars in a constellation. But they had other players less talented, but a part of the constellation, a part of the team. And what the enemy wants to do is always pull the bright star out and make the bright star think it's better than the other star when the bright star would never be seen as a bright star if it were not for the star that was not so bright. because it appears that our offering is not accepted. There was something wrong with Cain's offering because the Lord said, if thou doest well, surely it will be accepted. So he's telling him, maybe there's something you didn't do quite well. Can you go back over that and do it a little better? But Cain couldn't hear. He was angry now. You did me. Cain's ego got involved here. He felt disrespected. Well, what the hell did he know about disrespect? He just got here. God just created his mother and father, and the fool just got here. And he is so great, God himself is talking to him like he talked to his mother and father. And God said to him, not some stranger. Why is your countenance falling? Why are you angry? God wants him to question himself. Too few of us, when we are angry, want to question ourselves. What is our motive? Has our ego gotten in the way? Why am I angry? Why has my face fallen? So God said, Cain, if you do well, you will be accepted. Ooh, the master 
of all creation is telling a person who is not listening. I started, Reverend Al, with him that hath ears. Let him hear. And we talked about the impediments that stop a person from hearing. So now, God is talking, but the boy is so angry, he's not hearing. And if you notice, when somebody is angry, it's very difficult to get somebody to hear. I couldn't sleep last night. I was so up from the meeting we had yesterday, and, and, and I knew I knew I was tired, so usually I let the television rock me to sleep, so I put the TV on, and then up came Jerry Springer, about maybe one or two in the morning. Well, I don't listen to this garbage, but my cable was out, so I only had a few stations. So. <laughs> so I said, well, let me see what Jerry's talking about. And his, his subject matter was, based on sexual infidelity, a sister wanted to tell her sister that I slept with your husband and now I am pregnant with your husband's baby. The sister does not know what her sister's going to tell her. So now, the cameras are, let's catch this emotional reaction now. This is, this is good TV. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> so the sister sits down in the chair. You have something you want to tell your sister? Yeah. Well, tell her. They bring her out. I've been sleeping with your husband for three years. Her face fell immediately. Anger came up. Then the bomb she dropped a few minutes later is, and I'm pregnant with his child. And Jerry's asking, why are you staying with him? Are you going to stay with him? Do you love this one more than you love it? And all of a sudden, madness breaks out. And then the two of them jump up, and they're at each other. And they have some big burly god trying to stand between the two. And this is TV, exploiting pain, exploiting hurt, exploiting passion. Anger. has to be controlled. Lest in our anger we harm what we love. Jesus got angry. It seems to me that it was the only time that he seemed greatly disturbed over the money changers in the temple. They were defiling 
the house of God because they love money more than the principle that the house is founded upon. So Jesus went to driving them out of the temple with anger. But his anger was controlled. He let them know he was angry and why he was angry, and he took an appropriate action. Controlled anger, controlled disapproval, controlled chastisement, but the result was they understood there was another side to Jesus. Though loving, though kind, though merciful, though sweet, there was another side. And no matter how good any of us think we are, we are all capable of doing horrendous things when circumstances make us angry and we lose control in that moment of passion. The subject today is God's wrath. God's anger. Who would want to make God angry? Yet, the scriptures from the Old and the New Testament, as well as the Quran, teach us that he was angry at the children of Israel because they disrespected him and it wasn't ego look at what he said I came to you in Egypt I destroyed your enemies for you I brought you up out of Egypt I did parted the Red Sea for you and slaughtered your enemies. I brought you into the wilderness and I brought down manna from heaven. I, I did this for you. And when Moses, through whom I did these things, came to me, to get even greater good for you. You went and set up another God beside me. Ooh. What you think about a man who does for a woman? I work in the foundry so that you can stay home and care for my children. I bring my money home and put food on the table and dress you and dress my children. I suffer the abuse of a foreman that hates black people, but I take it all to come back home to you. And now I come home and find another man in my bed. In a moment of passion, <coughs> he reaches for his pistol. You can't control him now. Because what he did did not deserve that. So his anger is so kindled now. I'll kill you both. Now you may say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> well, 
But in reality, it's a circumstance over which we did not have control. And it led to life imprisonment. This is the story of our lives. Brothers and sisters, living in this kind of world of injustice, we are constantly angry. When you live in a society, a world like this, that is founded on racism, sexism, and unbridled materialism, we who have been servitude slaves, never finding justice, have anger in us, not because we think we've been disrespected. We know we have been disrespected. And if God, if God ever asked us, like he asked Cain, why is your countenance fallen? And why are you angry? We could say, God, 400 years of injustice. 400 years of watching our women raped and disrespected, our children slaughtered. Why shouldn't I be angry? And one day, the anger will not be able to be controlled. God is going to let the anger loose like a mighty hurricane or tornado or earthquake or volcanic eruption. Then America will know that the price of injustice is the destruction of your country. We are not envious of white people like Cain was envious of Abel. We're not angry because it appears as though God has accepted them and not us. You don't hear black folk talking like that. Black folk love God. In spite of their pain and their suffering, they never charge God. You diss me. They ask questions like Job. Why, why God? I think we have a right to ask why. Not disrespectfully of God. But why should we suffer like this? Could you give us an answer? And God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind of his confusion and then let him know that there was a wager between me and the devil. The devil told me that if I remove this hedge from around you, that he could make you curse me to my face. And I told the devil, you can have him. Just don't take his life. And I will remove the hedge of protection from around him do to him what you will. Just don't take his life. 
he will not curse me. And Job lost everything. But you never find where Job got angry with God. He questioned him out of confusion. I don't understand. His wife got upset. Why don't you just curse him and die? And he rebuked her. Woman, you speak as a fool. He didn't call her a fool. He was wise. He, <laughs> even in his pain, he said, you speak as the foolish. Whenever God is angry, his anger is justified. And when he lets loose his anger, the destructive fury of his power destroys everything that it touches. Now, the Bible says, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and the proud, and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. And he shall destroy them, leaving neither root nor branch. That when he comes to pluck up the wicked, he's not cutting off a branch. He's killing it at the root. Now, pastors today speak of the goodness of Jesus Christ and the mercy of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. But they're a little slow in preaching the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. And I thought that for the few remaining minutes, God controlled anger now out of control. When Moses met God in a burning bush, the bush was burning, but it was not consumed. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the anger of God was so great, but yet controlled. So the bush never burned. But the fire was there. God withheld his wrath and sent his servant to Pharaoh to give him a chance. Give him a chance. Because God must not be untrue to his own nature. He must show mercy and must be willing to forgive even the worst enemy, but he must give you a chance to receive of his grace so he controls his anger. And he sends you a warner. Then he sits back and watches. How did you treat the warning? How did you treat my warner? Moses went to Pharaoh and said, Look, you got to let him go. Pharaoh's ego was raised. Who sent you? 
he had a nerve to tell you to talk to me like that. Who is it that sent you? He said, tell him I am that I am. Woo! When he used the present tense, I am, meaning I'm present. I am in existence. I am that I am. Pharaoh should have known that now the God of heaven was present and a false God assuming the position of the true God. There had to be a challenge now. So it is with the white man and his world. Now I gotta say it just like it is. The white man has challenged God. That I am a God beside God. So Isaiah the prophet says, he sits in the north, saying that I shall ascend above the clouds. And God says, though you ascend, yet shall I bring you down to the pit, to the sides of hell. So there's a battle now that we have to talk about. That battle is going on as we speak. I have to tell you, Reverend Al, how I admire you for your constant stand for those who are too weak to stand for themselves. The constant stand of brothers like Brother Al and many others who feel the pain and the hurt of a people because of injustice and we're always going up against those in authority whose hearts are hardened to the pain and suffering of the little people. So now, God's wrath is kindled. But before he brings the total wrath down, he gives a little in a chastisement to let Pharaoh know, see, I got you. Don't let me shoot all my arrows at you. And every plague got harder and harder until the plague of the killing of the firstborn out of every house. Then it was over. Pharaoh decided to let them go. And then his ego, hell with it, huh? Let's let the army and go get them. We're going to face that soon. We're going to face that soon. You know, the cry among us for reparations is a very real cry. Our people need the damage of 400 years of injustice repaired. The cry of the native people for justice needs a response. The cry of the people of Puerto Rico against the bombing of Vieques need to respond. The arrogance of power. Well, we'll stop it in the year 2003. 
like they said they would give back the Panama Canal. But they still got it. Government is supposed to be the servant of the people. And if the people do not want it, the government should not do it. Not two years from now, but right now. Right now. What Sister Jackie Jackson did was to focus our attention on the pain and suffering of another member of the human family. You can't say we shouldn't be concerned with that. That's our people too. We can't say the embargo of Cuba is something that we shouldn't talk about, fight against. That's our people too. We can't say that the suffering of the people in Iraq is something we should turn our eyes away from. That's our people too. You say, well, wait a minute. Those are Arabs. When you grow, you will come to know that your suffering and mine, as Martin King said, undeserved suffering is redemptive. What we don't know is that we have been chosen out of the furnace of affliction to be an instrument of redemption. I had a talk, Reverend Al, with a very highly placed member of the Jewish rabbinate. He's over 4,000 North American rabbis and the Secretary of the World Jewish Congress. Russell Simmons, the hip-hop guru, arranged the meeting at his home. Martin Luther King III was there. Dr. Cornell um, West was there. The rabbi and his wife and the the head of um, uh, an ethics um, organization was there, a white person and his wife. And we started talking about Jewish-black relationships. And the rabbi said, that the last person that they, in words, had to overcome was Louis Farrakhan. And the talk got heated, but Farrakhan's face never fell. Wait. And he never got angry. I was just as calm as a doctor dealing with an ill patient. And when I found that no matter how brilliant and cogent my argument was on the basis of language and its conveyance of an idea. He didn't want to hear the argument. Their view 
was their view. And I said, oh, I see what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with illness. The rabbi became a little angry. He said, you see, it's the use of language again. You, you use the word illness. I said, how would you want me to say it? That you are not well? Or that you have a problem? Show me a better way to say what I mean. Because I don't wish to offend you. But what I see is 2,000 years of your exile. 2,000 years of your suffering and probably as many years of guilt for failing in your part of your covenant relationship with God has caused an illness that demands divine intervention. So help me, God. These are my words. Is that correct? Now, I'm saying that to say this. If I allowed myself to get angry because they refused to hear my words, I would never have been able to see the scope of the illness with which I had to deal. Brother Leonard was there, and Brother Leonard spoke of, in the last 10 years, every black leader of consequence, you have called them anti-Semites. And he ran the list down. None of them who were anti-Semitic. Andrew Young. Nelson Mandela. The mayor of Los Angeles. Tom Bradley. Anybody that didn't do what they expected to be done in the manner Jesse Jackson. And we, we ran the list down. And it got hot. But I was so calm. I said, we must not let this end on a sour note. Because we have made a good first step that must be followed by many more. You were there, Minister Benjamin, were you not? The next day, I met with another rabbi. And that rabbi said, I have studied you, Farrakhan. You're 70 years old. I know you're not anti-Semitic. I know that Foxman is wrong, and I read Abraham uh, Bronfman's, uh, Edgar Bronfman's, uh, and I know he's wrong. I know he lied. But I see you as the only one who can be a bridge between the Arabs and the Israelis. He said the Arabs are A, the Israelis are C, and what they need is B to link A and C. And you, Farrakhan, are B. Wait, wait. But he said, I want to help you and coach you in understanding the Jewish mind. Now, you may say, who is he to a coach Farrakhan? 
Farrakhan needs coaching. When you get so arrogant that you think you don't need a coach, no matter how great your raw talent is, you need a trainer to bring it out. And where I have failed is in not knowing or caring even about the mind and the state of that mind as I rebuke them. I care about you. So even though I rebuke you, yet there's so much love in it, you know what I mean? You say, well, I, I can't kick my butt, but I know he loves me, and I'm with Farrakhan. But sometimes maybe Farrakhan needs a little butt kicking. Now, you may say, now, Farrakhan, why did you say that? Well, God sends people to prophets and sends people to kings to help them be more effective. You got the right spirit, you, you got the right word, but maybe you're not conveying it properly. Will you be open? Or will your face fall and you get angry and sin lieth at the door? I'm saying all of that to say this. People's minds are sacred. And their minds have been polluted disfigured and anybody that goes to heal humanity in its diverse and yet common suffering has to be skilled in the use of language if I could really sing a beautiful song and I sang for you, everybody can recognize. That means nations have to pass away. Kingdom have to pass away. System. have to pass away and people who operate systems who uphold the kingdom and are in the nations that fight against the kingdom of God they all got to go I'm sorry, religion as it's known. I'm a Muslim. I said religion. Gotta go. Why you gotta go? You failed. There's more people united in the fight against crack cocaine than there are united by religion. I went to a crack rehab place where my son was. And in his graduation, there were Jews, Muslims, Christians, Hispanic, Arab, black, white. And when they called each other brother and sister, they meant it. And you know what united them? A struggle. 
against that affliction that was common to them all. So their color made no difference. Their culture made no difference. Their language made no difference. Their religion made no difference. But in religion, it's the biggest divider and perpetrator of evil in the name of God. Religion got to go. The Christianity that you know got to go. It has failed. Judaism got to go. Buddhism got to go. Shintoism, I don't care what ism. All of it. I make all things well, you're going to college now, bless your heart. And you're seeking your degree in that which has to go. So, doctor, in a medicine that has to go, the profession. And one of them got away. I would leave the 99, go find you the one. You have to be completely uh, made over again. Million Family March is now available on video cassette, featuring the timely and inspiring message by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The family is the basic unit of civilization. Therefore, everything must be done to care for the family unit. The Million Family March on video cassette, only $29.95. Call 1-888-695-3982. The historic 1998 Holy Day of Atonement Address, Atonement, the Healing for a Sin-Sick Nation, is now available. Hear the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan speak on such topics as America, a modern Nineveh, how President Clinton can save the country, Atonement, the Healing Law, the eight steps of atonement, what are they? You can add this historic address to your collection on CD or videotape for the unbelievable price of only $19 per item. To purchase this and many other lectures by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, call the Final Call Administration Building at 773-602-1230 or write to 734 West 79th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60620. <laughs>
Give me that beat, though. The so-called American Negro have to be completely re-educated. Yeah, yeah. And the condition that he is now in, he's not fit for self. Uh-huh. If I had a hundred G. Beneficent, the merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the human family. We thank him for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel of the New Testament. We thank him for Muhammad and the Qur'an. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. As a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I could never thank Allah enough for his coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and his intervention in our affairs, raising up among us one to lead, teach, and guide us to the straight path of God, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very thankful to Allah to be with you again. Okay. I want to thank our visitors and friends who have uh, visited us from various communities in Chicago. And I want to thank my many helpers from around this nation who have honored me by their presence on this weekend. I hope, as I always do, that what Allah bless me to give to you will be beneficial to you, helpful to you, and raise you in degree of excellence. What is the purpose of communication? Almighty God, allowed oral language long before the written. And he gives animals and birds and all of his creatures a sound that they make, which the other creature of similar nature 
can understand that sound. I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say that David was taught the language of the birds. That means that birds have a means of expression and communication that other birds understand. We as human beings, the greatest of God's creation, however, have trouble communicating. What is it about the language that we use that creates confusion rather than understanding? This is not my subject, but I just thought I would uh, enter it by this door. The uh, the human being is like the Tower of Babel. We all speak different languages, and even when we speak the same language, we have problems communicating our thoughts, our ideas.